Hello, uh, this is uh, the opening class of uh, the uh, International High School Mars Mission Design Contest. And um, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, I hope we can make this a unique uh, education experience uh, for you and hopefully a demonstration to educators around the world about a new way to teach, okay? Because, okay, we've all been in school now for nine, 10, 12 years, and you know how it works. They lecture you and then they give you a test um, and you try to repeat back to them the answers that they fed you. Well, there's another way to do this uh, and it's much more creative and it is used in university engineering design classes, okay? And what it is is this, yeah, engineers in universities, they do take a lot of classes of the conventional sort uh, that you are quite experienced with, except of course on a higher level. But there's also at least one class that every engineer takes in any good engineering school and sometimes more than one, which is the design class. And the way this works is uh, the class is assigned to design something. Um, and, uh, you know, and I myself have backgrounds both in aerospace and nuclear engineering. So I had two design classes, one in each of these areas. But for instance, you design something like in the aerospace, a fighter aircraft, it might be, and you're given a set of requirements. Um, it has to fly at least this high and at least this fast and has to be able to carry uh, uh, at least this much weapons and, um, and it can't cost more than X and uh, this and that and the other thing. And it has to be maneuverable. Now, in general, these requirements conflict with each other. The stronger you build it, the heavier it's going to be, and uh, the less weight you'll have for weapons or engines or other things. Uh, and generally speaking, to make anything better, it's going to cost more. And so you get divided into teams. You might have a propulsion team, a weapons team, an aerodynamics team, a structures team, a costing team. And each one tries, you know, the aerodynamics team tries to come up with the best aerodynamic form for the plane. Uh, but this uh, conflicts with the kind of weapons that the weapons team want to put on it. Um, and what they want uh, takes away mass that the, the propulsion people want. Uh, more weapons means you're flying slower. Um, so how do you negotiate this? How do you reach the best possible overall design, which is uh, in general a compromise between uh, optimizing the various features of the plane? And the same is true if you're designing a nuclear reactor or anything, if, if you really want to know, um, an automobile, a house, it all comes down to compromises between uh, different uh, forms of optimization. Now, the challenge that you are being given is to design a human Mars mission, okay? And the purpose of your mission is to accomplish as much scientific exploration as you can, okay? Um, now, we're not asking you to design the interplanetary propulsion system or the landing system. Uh, we are asking you to design uh, the surface habitation and laboratory and the exploration systems and the exploration program. Um, that is, um, and we'll, we'll get into this in a minute, uh, but there's a lot of things to explore for on Mars. There's the geology, there's the climatology, there is the paleontology, that is the possibilities of past life on Mars. And then there's the astrobiology, the possibility of present life on Mars. Now, I happen to be a fan of the latter two subjects, but I'm not the last word on this uh, thing. And even though, yeah, I am the president of the Mars Society, and I'll be one of the judges of this uh, design contest, because you're going to be divided into a number of teams, which each of which will have to do a design, and you're going to compete your designs against each other. There will be other judges, and they will have other ideas. And in fact, 
we've got a, a series of lectures planned for you by different people. And we have had ne made no effort to put together a party line of getting all these different lecturers to agree with each other on what the most important things about Mars are. Um, because there are different opinions about this. And you are gonna have to judge who's making sense and who isn't, and how much um, of your effort can be used to meeting the uh, priorities uh, that are put forth to you by uh, one of these people versus that of the others. You're gonna have to work this out. In other words, you're gonna have to figure out what's really important here, uh, and you're gonna have to figure out the best way to do it. Um, now, um, I, I'm going to suggest some background reading here, okay, which uh, is my book, The Case for Mars, which you can get on Amazon in either paper or Kindle form or used books or used bookstores, or it may be in your public library because uh, there are, this does exist in the public library system, or maybe you even want to just do the audio book. And then we're also gonna send you a link to a lecture I gave on the Mars Direct Plan, on my plan for human missions to Mars, which you should all watch, okay? That's free, it's online. It's watching an hour of television to get some background on human Mars missions. Now, as I see it, the basic story about Mars is this. Uh, hold on. Um, spam or something, but whatever. Um, the um, Mars today is a cold and dry climate. Its atmosphere is only 1% as thick as the Earth's. That is, it's about as thick as the Earth's atmosphere at 100,000 feet altitude. And it's 95% carbon dioxide is the atmosphere, about 3% nitrogen, 2% argon. Uh, so people on Mars are going to have to wear spacesuits while they go out and explore, and they're going to have to live inside of pressurized habitats, like basically spacecraft, um, go out through an airlock, go out and explore. But even though, and the average temperature on Mars is about minus 50 centigrade, although in the middle of the day near the equator, it gets up to about positive 20 centigrade, which is say about 70 Fahrenheit. Um, in, at night, it then goes down to minus 90. Um, average is about minus 50, which means that the surface temperature average is too cold for liquid water. There is water on Mars. It's there in the form of ice and permafrost. There are glaciers on Mars. That is, in addition to the polar caps that we can see, if you move down from the North Pole down to about 38 degrees north, which is the same latitude of San Francisco or Athens on Earth, there are big glaciers hidden by a, only a half a meter or a meter of dust. Um, and so there's water there. And, uh, and if you go deeper underground though, it gets warmer. So there may very well be a lot of scientists believe, I believe that there is liquid water underground on Mars. And liquid water is necessary for life. Life can exist in dormant form without liquid water. Uh, bacteria can survive in outer space in vacuum, but not uh, active. They would be just in a dormant form. And then if they landed on earth or some other place that had liquid water, then they could come alive again. But in terms of actually living, carrying on a metabolism, life needs liquid water. It doesn't need liquid water all the time. You know, in the American desert, there's a kind of shrimp uh, that lives only once every couple of years when it rains and uh, a little depression that they're in, a puddle gets filled with water and then their eggs hatch and they come alive and they start swimming around and do everything that shrimp do. Um, but then before it dries up, uh, they lay eggs and the eggs survive in complete dry um, conditions for years until the rain comes and um, they come back to life. So even macroscopic animals like shrimp or, or of course, you know, seeds have been recovered from Egyptian pyramids and grown into plants. So yes, they, they can live, uh, they can exist in alive, dormant, uh, without liquid water. And in some cases uh, for 
the hundred million years even uh, bacteria have been revived from uh, that were stored in amber. Uh, but to actually be alive, there has to be liquid water at least every once in a while. And uh, there is liquid water underground on Mars, uh, in some places perhaps permanently, in other places perhaps once in a while. So there could be life there. Now, here's the thing. Why? Because the early Mars, while Mars is cold and dry today, the early Mars, like three and a half billion years ago, both the Earth and Mars formed about four billion, four and a half billion years ago. And then first they were very hot, they were molten, and then they cooled down enough to have lift good water on their surface. So three and a half billion years ago, both the Earth and Mars were warm, wet planets with liquid water on their surface. And, and both of them, by the way, had a mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere. Um, the Earth did not have oxygen of any quantity in its atmosphere until sometime later when green plants made oxygen and put it in our atmosphere. The oxygen in our atmosphere is an artifact of life. Um, but that's not the story. Mars um, had liquid water and a CO2 atmosphere. In, in other words, the early Mars and the early Earth were twins. And we have fossils of life on Earth, bacterial life, microbes, going back three and a half billion years to the same period when Earth and Mars were twins. So it's possible that life could have appeared on Mars. And it could have appeared in a number of ways. First of all, um, if the theory is correct that life evolves from chemistry, from simple chemicals combining to make more complex chemicals until they actually become uh, living microbes, um, if, if that is a natural process that occurs spontaneously wherever you have the right physical and chemical conditions, then that caused life to appear on Earth. It could have also caused life to appear on Mars. If the conditions were similar, why not have a similar result? Although maybe not an identical result. You know, people are fundamentally similar, um, but people around the world have all developed uh, different languages, some of which are extremely different from each other some of which have certain similarities to each other. So we have families of languages, but English and Chinese are entirely different. Yes, you can find similarities between English and French because they have a common origin, but English and French are one thing and Chinese and certain other Asian languages, they're totally different. Um, languages, they use very different alphabets. They use completely different systems of conveying information either verbally or in writing, and yet they do the same thing. You can tell stories in them, you can write books in them. So, so maybe, uh, you know, while all Earth life has a fundamental similarity, you know, uh, it, it all uses DNA and RNA as a method of recording information from one generation to the next, whether it's bacteria or pine trees or people, we all use that. So that's like all life on Earth uses uh, the same alphabet, if you will. So like you know, we actually use the Latin alphabet, the alphabet that we use if your English speaker was created by the Romans. Um, but the Chinese don't use that alphabet. They were never part of the Roman empire. They had their own empire. They use a very different kind of writing. Uh, and in fact, it's not even an alphabet. It doesn't work by conveying sounds, it can work uh, the stylized form of pictures. Now, there are also other places on earth that use alphabets that have some relationship to the Roman alphabet, like for instance, the Russian alphabet. Um, but other places have alphabets like the Korean alphabet, which is a real alphabet. It works on the principle of sounds, but it has no relationship. Its letters are completely different from our alphabet. Uh, so maybe, that's what happened. Two separate origins of life. And were they exactly the same or were they wildly different? We don't know. Uh, and if, to find that out, uh, you might have to drill down underground on Mars to reach the groundwater, which is maybe a kilometer below the surface and bring up water samples and see if there's anything living in it and then examine its biochemistry. Now, if you don't wanna do that, you can roam around on the surface and look for fossils of past life, just like 
the bacteria from three and a half billion years ago left fossils on the surface of Earth. You can find them in Australia, for example. Um, maybe fossil hunters can find fossils of past life on Mars. Now that would tell you you had life, but it might not tell you what the biochemistry was or other things about it as much as you could get by finding living organisms. Um, if you find living organisms, you also have to take measures to make sure that you didn't bring them yourself. Um, so you have to do the science in a way that uh, you, if you find microbes in Martian water, make sure that you didn't put those microbes there. Now, if they're entirely different than Earth microbes, then that's a giveaway. But what if they look the same? They still could be native to Mars, or maybe you brought them. You need to be able to tell that difference. Um, the then there's other things. People want to know about the geological history of Mars. People want to know about the resources of Mars for future human settlement, to prospect for valuable uh, and essential metals and other things. Uh, you know, so that's another aspect of Mars exploration. But anyway, there's all these questions concerning Mars. And here you are, you've been landed on Mars. Now, here's the deal. You're going to have to design this mission, starting with the size of the crew. You can have up to five people, but you should understand that if you have five people, you need supplies for five people. Um, and um, the more supplies you have, the less scientific equipment you can bring. Okay. Um, so is it better to have five people? And, and then also the length of the stay. You can stay up to a year and a half. Okay. But once again, the longer you stay, the more supplies you need and the less equipment you can bring. Now, not all scientific equipment weighs a great deal. Um, some of it are pretty lightweight instruments that are not going to be a problem to bring at all. You're going to have to decide, by the way, which instruments you want to bring to do the kind of science you want to do. But let's say you want to bring vehicles. Um, the, maybe you can get around on small vehicles. You may be familiar with all-terrain vehicles. They're kind of like motorcycles with four wheels, and they're very good for going over rough terrain. They weigh a certain amount, though. But maybe you want something bigger, like a pressurized rover. Imagine something about the size of a SUV or a sport utility vehicle, or even a school bus. Um, traveling around in something like that, you could have, um, you know, if you're traveling on an all-terrain vehicle, you're going to be wearing a spacesuit sitting on it, and it's helping you get around some, but you can't go too far with it because you're going to have to come back before nightfall. You can't live in, on that. You, you know, in a pressurized rover, you could stay in it overnight and keep going. And in a RV-sized vehicle, um, now you have a mobile laboratory. Uh, you can do your analysis in the field. You don't have to stay at one base. But these things get heavier. And the more of that kind of stuff you bring, um, the less supplies you'll have. And you either have to stay with a shorter mission crew or uh, a smaller crew. Um, the, now, there's other kinds of ways to explore on Mars. You know, the Perseverance mission brought a little helicopter called Ingenuity to Mars. Now, you could bring little tiny helicopters like Ingenuity. They don't weigh very much, but they, aside from its camera, it had no scientific instruments. You could bring a larger helicopter, maybe something that weighs 50 kilograms and could travel around and have a lot of instruments on it and go landing on places. And that could help you do science. Um, across a very large distance. Uh, you know, fact number one about Mars, it's big, okay? It has a surface area equal to all the continents of the Earth put together. So the further you can explore, the more exploration you can get done. And using aircraft such as helicopters could do it. Maybe even you bring a helicopter that's big enough for the crew to travel in, or at least one or two members of the crew to travel in. Then, you know, a person on foot in a spacesuit probably at best can travel, you know, a few kilometers in a day. Uh, a person on an all-terrain vehicle might be able to do 20 kilometers in a day. 
but a helicopter could do a couple of hundred kilometers in a day or even more, um, or maybe even use fixed wing aircraft. Um, now, you'd, if you go that way, you could go a lot farther, but you would have to find a way for them to take off and land on Mars where regrettably there are no current airports. Um, the, so there's all kinds of equipment that you could choose to bring and you don't have enough for everything, okay? Now also there's different places you can go. Now you're gonna hear from other lecturers and, and listen, in all of this, you're invited to do independent research um, to find the most interesting places to go on Mars. Um, to do, in other words, you want to make the, the most powerful scientific exploration mission you can. Now, at the pole, there's ice. Um, some people think that buried in the ice, you might find preserved uh, uh, past Martian life, basically frozen, preserved. Um, certainly there's water, obviously, there, which is something of interest for future missions. But the poles, you know, they have half the year dark, half the year sunlight. So if you're going to go to the poles, you probably want to go during polar summer. Um, and you'd have to take account for operating that environment. There uh, at the equator, okay, there's not any ice near the surface, but you have the maximum sunlight to provide solar power. Um, the, uh, and there's certainly, for instance, near the equator, there's some very interesting uh, geologic features such as the Vallis Marineris, which is a canyon on Mars, uh, as big as the uh, Grand Canyon on Earth. Uh, actually, it's uh, three times the size of the Grand Canyon on Earth and uh, three times as long, three times as deep, and the stratigraphy that has been cut away. And there's also many smaller, but nevertheless quite large canyons separated across Mars. There are places on Mars where there are um, dried up riverbeds. Because as I mentioned, the early Mars was warm and wet. And one of the reasons why we know that is because we can see water erosion features scattered all over uh, Mars including networks of rivers and rivers deposit materials from upstream to downstream. And they also carve channels into the sediments around them. Um, and also there could have been some of them empty into what was once uh, lakes. Uh, and when the lakes dried up, well, in one place, some of our rovers have found salt deposits. It was like salt water that evaporated leave behind salt deposits. Well, maybe it evaporated and left behind the remains of aquatic organisms. Uh, so those are places that you might want to explore. So you're going to have to choose where you want to go. Okay, that's point one. Point two, if you choose where you want to go, you want to choose equipment that is appropriate for that. Because, for example, uh, Let's say you go for the school bus size, you know, RV size moving laboratory. You have to take it to a place where the terrain is such that it can actually travel over that terrain. There's no point taking a movable RV uh, laboratory to Mars if you're in terrain that is just too rocky and rough for it to uh, negotiate the terrain. So you wanna, if you're gonna bring certain kinds of equipment, you want to, um, make sure they're brought to a place where they can be useful. Uh, and again, uh, if you're going to a place that is very difficult to travel on foot, maybe that's the, if you want to explore there, then maybe that's the place where you want to bring helicopters, either little ones that can just be remote controlled and take instruments to places or even uh, uh, big ones where people can travel. Um, you know, if you're looking for subsurface life on Mars, you're gonna need to bring drilling equipment. Um, and people have different kinds of ideas on how to do drilling on Mars. You know, when they do drilling on Earth, uh, like for oil wells and stuff, um, they drill down and they put pipe um, to, to line the side of the hole as they go deeper and deeper. Well, that could take a lot of pipe, which weighs a lot. And everything weighs a lot. 
okay? Um, and you've got 30 metric tons, 30,000 kilograms. That's for the crew, its spacesuits, its supplies, its habitat, its life support system, its vehicles, its scientific instrumentation, its power supply, okay? You're gonna need power, okay? Now you could use solar power, you could put out panels on the surface of Mars, except you, you know that sunlight at Mars, because Mars is further from the sun than the Earth is, is only 40% as strong as sunlight is on Earth. And so you need more panels to create the same amount of electricity. Um, alternatively, you could use nuclear power, okay? And uh, you can read about space nuclear reactors in my book, it's the case for Mars. Um, the, uh, but basically a hundred kilowatt space nuclear reactor is estimated to weigh about four tons. And that will give you power day or night, uh, whether or not there are dust storms, solar power is interfered with by dust storms that can happen from time to time. If you go solar, you're gonna have to have a way of storing power. Um, if you could also use a smaller reactor and some solar power so that you have nuclear power during a, a dust storm. Um, and, uh, uh, but plenty of solar power when the sky is clear. Uh, but so you're gonna need to balance all these things. Okay. You're also gonna need to choose the crew. If you go with a crew of five, say, um, what, who are the skills? Of, of these crew members, who are they? Are they men or women? Are, is it an international crew or from just one country? There's advantages and disadvantages to all those choices. Uh, how old are they? Um, you know, what are their skills? Are they mechanics who are good at fixing things? Are they geologists? Are they microbiologists? Do you need a doctor? Um, the, who should be in the crew? Do you have everybody be a scientist? Or, uh, you know, maybe you can find people that are cross-trained um, so that for every essential crew, per, skill in the crew, there's at least two people that can do it. Because if there's only one person in the crew that can um, say troubleshoot electronics uh, and electronics fail, um, it, and that person uh, is incapacitated uh, in an accident, um, the crew could be in a lot of trouble. So, you know, how many crew members, what are their skills? And, and also then, if you're thinking about this crew, um, you know, what's the, the compatibility here? Uh, in other words, you, you wanna think this through. Uh, who's in command? Is it a democracy or is there a command? Um, the, uh, the, these are our decisions. And then uh, let me show you uh, a picture. Can you, what you're seeing here is this is an illustration of my Mars mission. Now, um, they're on Mars um, and, uh, okay, this conical vehicle here, that's the Earth return vehicle. You don't need to design that one, okay? That is assumed is available for you, that there is an ascent vehicle there to take you home. This, however, is the HAB module, okay? Now, what you're looking at here is, uh, it looks sort of like a tuna can, um, and it is eight meters in diameter, and it is um, about six meters tall. So it's got two decks, each with three meters of, of headspace, so about 10 feet. So, okay, nice ample ceilings. Um, and the upper deck of the HAB is actually uh, where the people live. Okay, so you've got a crew of five in a space um, of um, eight meters in diameter. Uh, it's about 500 square feet. Uh, which is a somewhat small apartment, but you know, you're going to Mars here, you're not.
living in luxury. You got five people living in there, and each with a small room, and then there's some other central spaces, a kitchen, a place where we're in sort of a, a ward room, that is to say like a dining room where everybody sits around the table, eats, talks to each other, stuff like that. Um, the, um, the lower deck of the ham um, is, mo is, is where there can be a laboratory, uh, a workshop. It's also where there's an airlock where you can go outside. And it's also where uh, you, you could put the bathroom or you could put the bathroom upstairs. Um, but it also has, in this case here, in this concept, there was a small pressurized rover. You can see it's like little SUV that could go driving out of it. Okay. And there's also a little unpressurized light truck over there next to the guy who's doing a balloon launch. So they've got two vehicles. Uh, a small pressurized vehicle and also an unpressurized vehicle, kind of a go-kart, um, but which seats two people. Um, and in this concept, there was both a nuclear reactor and some solar power. So if there was trouble with either one of them, um, there could be um, another source of power. Um, you're seeing over on the left-hand side, uh, in front of where the solar panels are, there's a drilling rig. So they're trying to drill down into the ground to uh, reach uh, the groundwater and maybe see if they can find Martian life. Now, in this case, the drilling rig is right at the base. Okay, so it could make use of electrical power from either the reactor or the solar panels to drill. Uh, if the, you wanted to drill in places away from the base, you'd have to have a mobile source of power. Now that could be um, well, a portable nuclear reactor or solar array, or it could be the engine of the car. Um, now in this concept, the vehicles that we used were not electrical. They, uh, in the Mars Direct Mission Plan, this ascent vehicle uses uh, a propellant system of methane and oxygen. And, um, which by the way is, is the propulsion system that SpaceX is gonna use on the Starship. Um, and you can make methane and ox oxygen from Martian carbon dioxide and water. Um, well, we can also make methane and oxygen and use it to power cars. And that was the idea here. Although you could also have electric cars with big batteries and they could be used to power drills at a distance from the site. Now I did mention uh, earlier in conjunction with drills, the conventional way to drill like an oil well is you use pipes to line the, the hole as it goes deeper. But you know, moles, uh, the little animals, uh, moles, the way they drill tunnels uh, is they just take the dirt in front of them and move it behind them. Take the dirt in front of them, move it behind them. So actually they never create a tunnel. They just move through the earth by moving uh, the, the dirt in front of them, behind them, and they can move through the earth. Well, conceivably, uh, the robotic equivalent of that could be made, uh, either fully independent or with a long wire attached to it. So it would go underground and be powered by the wire, and it could burrow deeply and maybe reach the underground water. Uh, you'll also notice here, there's a guy or a girl, I don't know, can't tell from this distance. Um, inflating a balloon. You can fly balloons on Mars. Um, and especially since uh, Mars has got a carbon dioxide atmosphere, there are a lot of gases that are lighter than carbon dioxide and can be used to fly balloons. Not only uh, helium and hydrogen, which we can use to fly balloons on Earth, or methane, which we're using for propellant. It has a molecular weight of 16, much less than CO2, but even nitrogen and oxygen can be float gases for balloons on Mars um, and they can't be on Earth. But with a balloon, you could launch them and they could fly very long distances. And you could have cameras on them doing aerial surveys or uh, maybe ground penetrating radar to try to look for underground water. You know, if you're gonna drill, maybe you want to find the place where the underground water is closest as possible to the surface or really where the surface comes down 
closest to the water because the water table probably is going to be flat. But the, making the shortest possible distance you need to drill to reach the underground water. Now you'll also notice in the center of the painting, there's people setting up an inflatable greenhouse. Now that's not scientific exploration, that's engineering exploration. They're setting up a greenhouse in order to learn how to grow crops on Mars. Now they might also eat some of those crops, so this could help their life support system. That is, if you can grow some food on Mars, you don't need to bring it all. Um, but you need to look at how big do you really want this greenhouse to be to produce enough food that the food you grow, which replaces food you need to bring, um, how does that compare to the mass of the greenhouse and all the systems needed to run it? Um, so, you know, do you need, a, is it, does it make sense to bring a big greenhouse and then you could radically cut the amount of supplies you need to bring? Or does the greenhouse weigh more than what it produces? And you would just bring a small greenhouse to learn about how to grow crops on Mars, but mostly bring your own uh, food and only just take samples from the greens grown in the greenhouse. Uh, these are some uh, of, of the ideas. So you need to choose your place, you need to choose your equipment, you need to choose your crew, um, and you, you need to choose your mission priorities. And you've got to package it all within 30 tons. Um, now, uh, you're going to be divided. You know, so the way this class is going to work is to get you up to speed, we're going to have a couple of weeks lectures of um, different experts talking about different kinds of things on Mars. Some talking about drilling on Mars, some talking about uh, the kind of crew you need, some talking about uh, airplanes on Mars or uh, other things, power systems for Mars. Um, and you'll get different points of view on this. Some of these uh, lecturers will say the exact opposite of each other. Uh, some might say, oh, solar energy is the way to go. And other ones, oh, no, nuclear energy is the way to go. You're going to have to figure this out um, for yourself. Um, and then you want to design this mission. As I say, it all has to fit within 30 tons. And you don't want to cut it too fine. Okay, you don't want to have, okay, let's say you, you're going to be on Mars for the full year and a half. You don't want to have food for exactly a year and a half. What if some of it gets spoiled? Uh, you, 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 you don't want to have just one vehicle. What if it breaks? Um, the, the, you you want, to want to have a certain amount of redundancy, redundancy of skills in the crew, as I mentioned as well. So all these things have to be worked out. Um, and uh, maybe it's better to have a bigger crew with lots of equipment, but stay for a shorter amount of time. Although time is useful, is necessary for exploration. I mean, um, I think the current NASA Mars mission plan, which involves just staying 30 days on Mars and then taking off, I think is ridiculous. I don't think it's even defensible. If you're gonna go all the way to Mars, you should take, and you have a year and a half available for you, you shouldn't scoot after 30 days. That's like planning on going on a vacation to Hawaii and uh, leaving you know, an hour after you arrive without ever going to the beach. Um, but maybe instead of saying the full year and a half, you might wanna stay half that amount of time or two thirds, one year, uh, in order to uh, not need as many supplies and therefore have uh, more crew and more equipment within uh, the mass available to you, okay? Uh, so that's a trade. All these things are trades. So now here you see this tuna can hab. Now I designed it with just two decks, but if you want to, you can make it three decks or four decks, okay, or five decks, okay, but it can't be more than eight meters in diameter. And the reason for that is that that's about the limit of what we can do with the kind of uh, tooling that people have. Um, for instance, that is the diameter that the Saturn V was. That is the diameter of the shuttle external tank, um, which is the main tank, say, on the SLS. 
the space launch system launch vehicle. Um, but you can add additional floors. So now, of course, the bigger you make it, once again, that's taking up mass, but you can give more ample crew quarters. You could have, uh, this one was really very minimal, two decks, uh, but you can make it a three decker or a four decker uh, and have more space for laboratories and other things, or just for people to have more personal space. So you're gonna have three groups, okay, uh, depending upon how, how many people we have on each team, uh, but let's say your team is a team of, of six, uh, you will have a science team to define the science mission. You'll have an engineering team to design all the systems necessary to do the mission. And you'll have a human factors and life support team to choose the crew, uh, to choose, um, You'll, they'll get the final say of the design of the half. Is two decks eight meters in diameter enough or do we really need three to give people enough space that they won't go crazy in a year and a half? You know, the longer you're gonna be there, the more having a little extra space will uh, benefit. And also uh, if you're gonna load up the lower deck of the half with all kinds of equipment, uh, maybe you need uh, another deck uh, for things like the laboratory and the workshop, um, and the bathroom, that kind of stuff. Um, so you want to figure that out. So you can make, you can add as many decks to that hab as you like, but you're going to have to figure out how much it weighs. Okay. And the weight of the hab is part of your 30 tons. Okay. So you've got science team, engineering team, and crew team, okay? That deals with crew selection, habitat design, and life support system, okay? Um, those are the things you're gonna need. And, um, you know, and the engineering team is gonna have to design the various systems that it's going to use. It's gonna have to figure out how much they weigh. And, you know, the science team is probably gonna want everything uh, they'll want helicopters and pressurized rovers and all-terrain vehicles and you name it, uh, but there isn't going to be enough uh, mass capacity for everything that everybody wants, and you're going to have to work the problem. So that's the basic introduction to what this class is about. Um, as I uh, mentioned, uh, background reading is this book, especially chapter one and chapter six, okay, and also there is a lecture that I gave at NASA Ames Research Center a few years ago. It's a video link that James can send to you. So you can all be sure to watch it. And so um, do we have the ability to take questions? Yes, we have uh, one question in the queue, Robert. Does it have to be, do we have to use technology currently in use on space missions? For example, something based on Boston Dynamics Atlas or SPOT? Do you, you want to use technology that is credible, okay? And, okay, you know, the, the fancier you get, in other words, if, okay, if, if you use technology that is currently proven, you're on very solid ground. Uh, we're assuming this mission is gonna be done within the next 10 years. So you can go beyond technology that we actually have right now, but, you can't invoke, you know, teleportation from Star Trek, okay? You, you can uh, assume, I mean, look, a lot of this stuff obviously does not exist right now. We don't currently have Mars uh, pressurized rover vehicles available, but the idea of a Mars car is not, you know, too wacky out there, okay? You can make a Mars car and it's a pressurized vehicle or an unpressurized vehicle that you have to travel on in your spacesuit. And it could be electrically powered or it could be fuel powered or even nuclear powered. Uh, you wanna come up with things that are credible. Now, sure, the, 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 you, you can try to get a little advanced, but the more advanced you get, points start to be taken off you when people say, I don't believe that. That's just too, too out there. You know, if someone says, I'm going to have a Mr. Fusion fusion reactor driving the car, like in the final scene of Back to the Future, 
I, I don't think the judges are going to think that's credible, okay, even though it, that is physically possible, unlike teleportation, which is just magic. But, but on the other hand, if you say the car is going to be driven by uh, lithium batteries like a Tesla car, uh, well, sure, uh, that is, um, you know, totally believable. And you could even assume batteries somewhat more advanced than are in current electric cars. But there it is. Other questions? Yes. Um, the second part of his question was, can we make our Martian colony interactive by using a game engine like Unity? I think what he means is to make some visuals to, I mean, we, we are asking everyone to write a report as part of right. this. Right, you're gonna be writing a report, okay. And um, the, uh, well, it depends how many teams we have, but um, we're gonna do a down select to at least two finalists that will shoot it out in uh, basically live presentations in front of a panel of judges to try to convince the judges that your design is the best. Um, the, um, and you can use any tools you want to create your illustrations. And creating illustrations is an excellent thing to do to convey the concepts that you are uh, designing. And even for understanding the concepts that you design. Somebody, the artist asks you, okay, you said you'd have this, where do these things go? I don't see how everything fits in here. Um, and um, so actually uh, doing some drawings is a very useful part of the engineering process. Um, last question, do we have to have one single trip? Like, would it be okay to after the main mission arrives, as long as it's all within a 1.5 year time frame? You're designing one mission. Now, if you say, this is what we're doing and part of our product of this mission is certain things that will help the next mission, that is a point in your favor. For instance, in this particular design, one of the things they're doing here is learning how to grow crops on Mars. And that's actually more for the benefit of a permanent base or a Martian colony. Um, but uh, you know, if you say, we're gonna create an airfield so that the colony can use airplanes that take off runways. Okay, that is something that you're doing for a subsequent mission. But you're designing this mission, you want to accomplish as much as you can with this mission. Great. Okay, um, thank you so much, Robert. We're gonna bring on our next speaker now. All right, and be sure to give them the link to that video. I sure will. Okay, thank you and hi, Homer. Thanks for joining us. All right. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Robert, thank you for having me. You're most welcome. I enjoyed, I only caught the last 15, 20 minutes of your lecture, but I certainly enjoyed it. I always learn something new from you, no matter what. So um, I appreciate that. All right, thanks. I'm gonna check out now, carry on. Thank you. So um, I'm not gonna particularly talk about uh, Mars because I'm not a Mars expert. And certainly you just heard from Dr. Z, who is very much a Mars expert. But I have to tell you that um, in the recent weeks, now, well, Dr. Zubrin will tell you, but I'm a big moon guy. I, I think we ought to get up to the moon. We need to uh, put a colony on the moon and we need to go mine the blame thing. And um, that's, that's my opinion. But in the last few weeks with the... Um, the photographs that we're getting uh, from Mars and especially the little helicopter up there, um, I am very, very impressed at what I'm seeing in terms of the layering of the hills and the way that the rocks are distributed along what um, definitely looks like um, water flow. And it, I believe that what we're going to find on Mars, I think we're, it's going to surprise everybody um, how Earth-like Mars was um, many, many millions of years ago. And I, and I can talk to, about that with some authority. In, my, uh, in the last 20 years, I've been a very avid amateur paleontologist. 
and I go out to Montana out in what they call the Hell Creek Formation. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm on the board at the Museum of the Rockies. Here's a, uh, that is a T-Rex tooth, kind of bad shape. That's why they let me keep it. Um, and uh, that's a uh, Triceratops baby nose horn. So they let me keep some of this stuff just to uh, show teachers and so on. But um, the Hell Creek Formation in Montana reminds me very, very much of what we're seeing right now on Mars. So um, I think uh, I am really looking forward. Um, and, and, I, and I will agree that it's gonna take uh, people up there uh, just like it does out in Montana to find these fossils. Um, ultimately, a robot won't do it. They just, they just don't have the eye for it. They don't have the time for it. They don't have the curiosity for it. They don't have the vision for it. Because I can tell you, when we go out to Montana, it takes two or three, four days before anybody can find any kind of fossil because all the rocks look the same. So it's gonna be very interesting. I'm not saying that we're gonna find like dinosaur fossils, but certainly I think that um, Mars was once, once Earth-like and it had an opportunity to at least uh, start uh, microbial life at the very, very minimum. So all that's gonna be very interesting. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Zubrin, James said I could talk about anything I wanted to talk about. And what I really wanna talk about is that um, we're, in, we're now in what I consider the third uh, golden age of space flight. A lot of people say, it's, oh, it's a second, but I think it's the third. And I'll explain that in just a second um, uh, by uh, recounting some history. And I think it's very, very important for those of us that are interested in space and space flight uh, to understand uh, the history of how we got uh, where we got. And, um, and I can probably best do that, I think, uh, by telling you uh, a certain amount of my story that is in um, this, uh, the book, uh, Rocket Boys. And uh, so that I'm going to take you back to the 1950s. Uh, a lot of people think of the 1950s as that wonderful place, the golden age of rock and roll. Everybody had the big shiny cars. Uh, gasoline was 32 cents a gallon, sometimes 28 cents. I remember that in the gas station across the street. Um, and um, everything, uh, uh, happy days and all that kind of thing, looking back on the 1950s. But in fact, it was a very, very dangerous time. Um, after World War II, the, um, the Soviet Union, as Russia and its satellites were called back then, um, and the United States, was um, involved in a long Cold War that ended up lasting for decades. And the Cold War, uh, in this case, uh, both sides of this Cold War, the Soviet Union, and the United States were loaded up with all kinds of nuclear weapons, planet busters. And uh, because um, we were pretty sure that they were going to try to destroy us, uh, we had actually B-52 and B-47 bombers loaded up with atomic bombs um, that would go up close to the North Pole and circuit, circle around the Arctic Circle just waiting for the command to head to the Soviet Union and start dropping these bombs on uh, air bases and cities. And uh, the, the Russians, the Soviet Union had a very similar situation. They had their uh, bison and bear bombers that were also circling up there loaded with nuclear weapons and they were coming, they would come our way just with a phone call. So um, it was a very dangerous time. This, that was a time when you saw uh, the, the old newsreels of the kids hiding under their desk and um, uh, with the idea that, uh, that at least you wouldn't be killed outright by a nuclear bomb, but it would get you sooner or later. Everybody knew that. So it was kind of a scary time. Um, so however, it was a standoff. They had their bombers. We had our bombers. And... Um, so uh, maybe we wouldn't, this Cold War would not turn into a hot war. But then in, um, I was 14 years old. Um, I was um, 
And I was growing up in this little coal town called Colwood, West Virginia. It was a pure company town, like a lot of company towns were around the United States at that time. Uh, uh, everybody, all, all adult males that lived in Colwood had to work for the coal mine. All adult females either had to be married uh, to a coal miner or, um, or they or teachers, they were, they were allowed if they were adult female to live, um, live there. But the, the company uh, owned every house, every street, every road, every tree, every store, um, and uh, even on the church. And uh, so the preacher was, a, uh, was a, a company employee. We used to laugh and say we got the low bid religion, uh, whatever it was. So that was the kind of town that a lot of, I lived in and a lot of, uh, of uh, teenagers back then uh, also lived in these kind of uh, company towns. Um, in October of 1957, I was 14 years old, as mentioned, and I was going to high school. The ten, I was in the 10th grade. Big Creek High School, which was two mountains away from Colwood. We measure everything in West Virginia by the number of mountains. And um, the, uh, the Russians, um, as, uh, probably the Pentagon was aware of this, probably the White House was aware of this. Most of the Americans were not aware of this, uh, that the Russians um, had a program to put a satellite into space. And um, in October of 1957, uh, it's seemingly out of nowhere, the Russians launched Sputnik, the world's first Earth satellite. And I can tell you this, that the, the Russian bear had taken a great big sledgehammer and hit Uncle Sam right between the eyes, um, could not have caused more fear to cross this country and actually most of the Western world. Uh, because it, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out pretty quick that if the Russians could put a satellite into orbit that was crossing the United States every day, then that could also be a nuclear weapon that could come right down on top of us wherever they wanted to put it. And um, therefore we had no defense uh, against this thing. So there was just uh, terrified headlines in the newspapers um, and um, all, all Congress people and senators and everybody stood up and, and uh, talked about uh, this awful thing that had happened. However, the 1950s was the golden age of rock and roll, that's true, but it was also the golden age of science fiction. And a lot of us teenagers, even in the coal camps of West Virginia, were big, big fans of the science fiction of that day. It was a very realistic type of science fiction with uh, Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov and all these great writers that talked about what it would be really like to go out and live uh, in the solar system and onto the stars. Now, we kids who love this science fiction didn't really think that any of that would happen in our lifetime. We really didn't expect that, um, that we would see anything in space uh, certainly not anything to the moon, and certainly not people in space. We just never imagined that that would happen in our lifetime. But all of a sudden, here was this Sputnik thing going around and around the Earth. And even though it was Russia and our big enemies, it still just lit up the imagination of a lot of young people uh, in the United States. And so I heard that... Um, that uh, Sputnik was actually going to pass over Colwood. So um, I told my mom that I was gonna go out in the backyard and watch uh, Sputnik uh, pass over. And um, her name was Elsie and she walked out into the yard and went to the fence line and told Mrs. Sherritts next door, but Sonny, as I was called back then, was gonna watch Sputnik that night. And Miss, Mrs. Sherrods walked across the yard and told Mrs. McLaughlin, who walked across the yard and told Mrs. Todd, who walked across the yard and told Mrs. Collins, I can name all these families uh, down our housing row there. Um, and, um, but I think the message got a little garbled as it went along because um, apparently uh, the people of Colwood thought the only place you could see Sputnik was in my backyard. And so, um, so come the night, uh, uh, that night, my dad walked out on the porch. Uh, his name was Homer. I'm a Homer Jr. 
and um, said, Elsie, why are all these people in our backyard? And she said, well, Homer, they're here to help Sonny watch Sputnik fly over. And he said, well, they can all just go home. President Eisenhower would never allow anything Russian to fly over Colwood. And he put on his hat, went up to the mine, never looked up. Uh, but uh, President Eisenhower, unfortunately, was not in charge of the laws of physics. And so um, Sputnik came uh, right on time. And the way that um, it just uh, fortunately, the way Sputnik came, our mountains are very close together, it split the valley. And I, I was absolutely mesmerized by the sight of this bright light that um, seemingly nothing could stop uh, going with just terrible purpose across our, our dark sky. And when I saw that, I thought to myself, somehow, some way, I want to be part of that. And like a lot of young uh, boys and girls across the country, um, we all of a sudden wanted to be part of that. Now, the way that I got involved with it was that my mother required uh, my brother and I and my dad to be at the supper table every night. And um, that... Um, uh, because she wanted to hear from us what we had done that day and what we were going to do the next day and so on. And when it got to be my turn, um, I had thought about uh, what to do, how to be part of the, what was happening in space. And it occurred to me that I would have to sit across from maybe somebody like uh, Werner von Braun um, and, and tell him what I knew and what I could do, because that's the way my dad hired coal miners. He was the superintendent at the mine. And so um, I thought, well, maybe I, I should know how to build a rocket or I should tell him that I know how to build a rocket. So um, when it came to be my time, um, I said, I'm going to build a rocket. And my dad didn't reply at all. He was probably thinking about what was going on up the coal mine. And uh, my brother, who was a big football star, got all the girls. He just laughed. He thought that was sounded like something his stupid brother would say, younger brother. But my mom got a thoughtful look on her face and she said, uh, well, don't blow yourself up. And I'd like to read a short little excerpt from my book, Rocket Boys, so you'll know what happened. I appointed myself chief rocket designer. Odell, who is a garbage man's son, provided me with a small discarded plastic flashlight to use as the body of the rocket. I emptied its batteries and punched a hole in its base with a nail. I cracked open my cherry bombs left over from the 4th of July, July and poured the powder from them into the flashlight and then wrapped it all up in electrical tape. You can kind of tell where this is going already, right? I, I took one of the cherry bomb fuses and I stuck it in the hole and I then glued the entire apparatus inside a fuselage of a D-wing plastic model airplane. Since Sherman, who couldn't run very fast because he had polio, he was placed in charge of a countdown, a position that allowed him to stand back. Roy Lee was to bring the matches. Odell was to strike the match and hand it to me. I would like to fuse and make a run for it. Everybody had something to do. When night came, we balanced our rocket looking wicked and sleek on top of my mother's rose garden fence. The fence was a source of some pride and satisfaction to her. It had taken six months of her reminding dad before he finally sent the company carpenter down from the mine to build it to protect her beloved rose bushes. The night was cold and clear, all the better we thought for us to track our rocket as it streaked across the dark and starry sky. We waited until some coal cars rumbled past, and then I lit the fuse and ran back to the grass at the edge of the rose bushes. Odell smacked his hand over his mouth to smother his excited giggle. Sparkles of fire dribbled out of the fuse. Sherman was counting backward from 10. We waited expectantly, and then Sherman reached zero and yelled, blast off, just as the cherry bomb powder detonated. There was an eyewitness, a miner waiting for a ride at the gas station across the street. For the edification of the fence gossipers, he would later describe what he had seen. There was, he reported, a huge flash in the Hickam's yard and a sound like God himself had clapped his hands. Then an arc of fire lifted up and up into the darkness, turning and cartwheeling and spewing bright sparks. The way the man told it, our rocket was a beautiful and glorious sight. And I guess he was right as far as it went. The only problem 
It wasn't our rocket that streaked into that dark and starry night. It was my mother's rose garden fence. So all the lights came on, all the houses up and down the valley in Colwood, uh, the dog, all the dogs were barking. People were pretty sure that, um, that um, the Russians had decided to attack the United States and started in Colwood. Um, my mom and dad walked out on the back porch. They could see me standing out, uh, even though it was nighttime and there were no street lights, they could see me quite clearly. I was all by myself. Uh, the other boys had run through the fence and disappeared into the night. And um, my dad took one look and said, you handle it, Elsie, and went back inside. And I, I have to tell you that um, if my mom had come out in the yard and killed me at that minute, there probably wouldn't have been a West Virginia jury that would have convicted her. But um, she came out and I was standing there, ears were ringing a little bit. My little dog was, little poteet dog was um, beside my leg shivering. And I really expected to get yelled at, which was not um, atypical. <laughs> but um, instead, my mom asked me a question, which surprised me. And she said, Sonny, do you know what your dad has planned for you after high school? And that was a surprising question because uh, I didn't know that my dad even knew hardly that I was alive. But um, she said, I heard him talking to the union boss. They were trying to figure out what to do with you. And uh, they think the, that that fellow that's in the, uh, the shack by the railroad tracks there that counts cars as they go by, the filled cars and the empty cars, he's gonna be leaving in a couple of years and they think he could take your place. And just for a minute, I thought, I wonder how much they pay for that. Uh, but um, she said, I think you're better than that. Uh, I've got the money, I've been saving up money and uh, I can send you to college, but um, you're, in order for me to do that, your dad will have to co-sign a check. And right now I'm pretty sure that he won't, he would not co-sign the check to let you go to college. He doesn't think you're smart enough and it'd be a waste of money. Now your brother, Jim, he'll go to college on a football scholarship. There's no problem on that. Uh, but I'm worried about you. And, um, so I think, um, maybe this is the way that you can impress your dad. Do you think you could build a rocket? And, uh, I, you know, I thought by the fact that um, the fence was out there burning and her rose bushes were in a million pieces, it's very, very clear that I did, had no clue on how to build a rocket. But that was the challenge that she gave me that night uh, to impress my dad, um, to, to maybe be able to convince him to let me go to college. I needed to learn how to build a rocket. Now, all I had to begin with were um, a drawing of a rocket that was in Life magazine that I had seen. And uh, I shared that with a few of the other boys, the Colwood boys there, there in my high school. And uh, however, we just, um, we didn't know, we didn't know what kind of propellant to use. We didn't know anything. And so um, um, I decided to talk to, um, uh, a young man uh, in my class at Big Creek High School whose name was Quentin Wilson. And Quentin was like the prototypical nerd of all time. And um, he, he um, walked around uh, with his head down, mumbling all the time. Uh, he carried a big briefcase full of books or whatever. We never quite knew what was in that briefcase. And, um, but he made a hundred on every test. He made an A in every class that he took except phys ed. He said his brains were too heavy to work out. Um, but like I said, um, most people were, most of the, my fellow students were very afraid of Quentin. Um, he was just, he was just strange. But uh, I thought if there was anybody at our school that might know how to build a rocket, it would be Quentin Wilson. So I sought out Quentin. And I sat down beside him. I kind of frightened him because he wasn't used to having anybody uh, sit beside him. And um, I said, uh, Quentin, do you know how to build a rocket? And he said, of course I know how to build a rocket. And then be uh, began to give me uh, a history lesson on uh, going back 2000 years to when the Chinese started building rockets 
and right on up through uh, Sputnik and Werner von Braun and so on. And I thought, well, that's an interesting history lesson, or I said, uh, Quentin, that's, in that's interesting, but how, to, how do we build a rocket? Do you know how we can build a rocket? And he said, well, first thing we gotta do is get black powder, because that's the way the Chinese started. And I'm going, what's black powder? And he said, well, it's potassium nitrate and charcoal and sulfur. And you can get all of those things in the company store, which I couldn't believe. I get the charcoal, yes, but sulfur, potassium nitrate. He said, just go to the drugstore and ask for saltpeter and flowers of sulfur. And sure enough, I went to the company store and they pushed it right across the counter to me. <laughs> Try that today. And um, so now we have the ingredients for uh, black powder. And we started mixing it up and testing it. In, um, and we had a hot water heater down in the basement that was coal fired. You open up a grate, put in coal to heat up the water. And so we used that to test uh, our black powder mixture to get the best uh, mixture that we could. And it stunk up our house, but dad was at the mine. Jim was playing football and mom didn't care. So it was all good. Uh, but the question was, of course, um, all right, so we've got now what I call the fuel and Quentin go tut tut, oh man, you're, it's not fuel, um, it is propellant, there's a difference, and the, the potassium nitrate is the oxidizer of the sulfur and charcoal as the fuel, okay, got it, so um, anyway, so I was learning a little bit already, but we still didn't know how to build a rocket. All I had was that picture in Life magazine, but there was a machinist uh, that was in a little machine shop all by himself at night. His name was Ike Bykovsky. He was a, an immigrant from, uh, from Russia, actually. He was a Russian Jew. A lot of Eastern Europeans came over to the United States after World War II to work in the mines and steel mills and such. And uh, so I went to Mr. Bykovsky and showed him the picture of Life magazine and asked him if he could build, uh, build that. And uh, he said, I can't do it. Your dad would not allow that. Um, it's company property. I'm, I'm working for the, oh yeah, okay, I'll do it. So he agreed to do it. And so looking at that picture in Life Magazine, uh, we came up with our first uh, rocket, quote unquote rocket. And um, he figured a piece of aluminum tubing or maybe steel tubing. Uh, wood nose cone and um, and either solder on the fins uh, or weld on the fins or put a washer or some kind of constriction. It showed in life that some sort of constriction at, at the bottom. We later, of course, found out that was a De La Val nozzle, but we didn't know that at the time. So I have the prop from the movie, um, which is a good approximation of the uh, rocket that uh, Mr. Bykovsky uh, built for me called Auk-1. We named it after a bird that couldn't fly. We thought that was pretty funny. Uh, but a wooden nose cone, an aluminum tube, um, and uh, fins, very simple fins uh, welded on. And at, uh, although the prop doesn't have it, um, he, um, he soldered on the first ones, a washer, just to give a little constriction there. And we loaded that up with black powder. And uh, um, it uh, at first just melted and made a big stink, but after he, we switched over to steel and we welded everything, um, even though it was a little heavy, it actually flew. The only problem was the first thing it did was we launched it very close to the coal mine and it hit my dad's office. And he was not uh, very pleased about uh, about that. So ultimately we got banished out of town to a great big dump of coal called slack. Slack coal was coal, but can't be used. Um, and, but it's, you can't put it back down in the mine. So you just basically have to put it somewhere and it's called a slack dump. And um, the cool thing about the slack dump was it was, it killed everything. Um, so uh, for West Virginia, it's hard to find flat land, but here was a whole valley about a mile long and about a third of a mile wide that was dead, uh, just black. And then all around it, the mountains had been clear cut because they used the timbers for the mine. And so we called that Cape Colwood after Cape Canaveral and began to build uh, rockets. We graduated over time um, to, um, to what we called rocket candy. And that was uh, potassium nitrate, the saltpeter, and sugar, which we found much, much easier 
uh, to mix up, especially when we learn to melt it. And don't try this at home, kids. And uh, and pour it into the uh, rocket, and we we figured out well it needs more surface area when the rocket didn't fly very high, so we put a spindle up through the middle of it. So it's very very well through trial and error approximated what uh, solid propellant uh, uh, professional solid propellant uh, rockets look like uh, today. However. Um, Quentin was not happy with this, even though we were getting our rockets up several hundred feet high now. Um, and actually in December, the United States tried to catch up with the Russians by launching their Vanguard rocket. And it got three feet off the pad and blew up. And so at that moment, we realized that we boys in Colwood were actually second place in the space race. Um, and that was a great responsibility. But um, Werner von Braun uh, caught, caught up in January of 1958 with the Jupiter C rocket and Explorer 1. And uh, so we were back to third, but we were still working real hard. Now, but Quentin, um, as mentioned, he just didn't like the idea that we were, we had rockets that work because he said we didn't know how it worked or why it worked and we needed a book. And uh, so uh, we had a teacher there at Big Creek High School, and her name was uh, Frida Riley, Miss Riley, who uh, had been valedictorian at the high school and then became valedictorian at uh, Concord Teachers College, come back to Big Creek. And she was, um, um, uh, was kind of upset, but in the huge trophy case at Big Creek High School, which was kind of known as a sports school, um, from when you walked in the front door of Big Creek, you saw this huge trophy case that went from uh, floor to ceiling and a long, long hallway just loaded with all kinds of glittering trophies for all the athletics um, championships that, um, that Big Creek had won. And um, she thought there should be an opportunity for the young people in this high school who are not athletes to have something in that trophy case. Well, um, when, after Sputnik, the uh, United States got really, really, really interested in creating a lot of uh, scientists and engineers, uh, what we call STEM. Uh, now, they didn't call it back, that back then, but, um, but they, needed, they felt like that we needed more scientists and engineers. So they had started to make our academic classes a lot tougher. Um, they were focusing on math. They were focusing on, focused on chemistry and physics in, in high school. And they started um, all across the country these science fairs with the idea of promoting especially STEM. And um, so Miss Riley got it in her head when she noticed us rocket boys, um, as we were called, uh, the Big Creek Missile Agency, as we called ourselves. Um, and she thought, you know what, maybe these boys are onto something here and maybe they could um, maybe go to the county science fair and, and win a third, maybe third place, second place ribbon or something that I can then go to the principal, Mr. Turner, and, and convince him to put this in a trophy case. So she came to me and told me she wanted me to do that. And I said, honestly, Ms. Riley, Quentin's right. We don't know why our rockets work. We just know that they do. Sometimes we don't know how high they're going to go. We don't know if they're going to blow up. We just don't know anything. We need a book. And it, it and Quentin's looked everywhere in, uh, in all the libraries, the high school libraries, the county libraries, and we can't find any book that tells us how to build a rocket. So Miss Riley went out, did her research, and um, she, with, with her own money, bought us a book called Principles of Guided Missile Design. And I later saw that same um, book in a PhD program for rocket scientists. In order to understand the very first page, you had to have a working knowledge of calculus and analy analytical geometry. Um, and I was having trouble at, at that time uh, with algebra. So, uh, however, um, uh, once we got that book and Quentin looked at it, who, by the way, Quentin already knew um, calculus. So. Um, but we, he thought that the rest of us boys needed to know it too. So Miss Riley lobbied with the uh, calculus was not taught at Big Creek, but she lobbied with the principal and, um, and we uh, managed to get after hours class in calculus and started studying this book. And what it occurred to us, what we saw in this book 
was that to bring rigor into our rocket building program, what we had to do was design a very sophisticated rocket nozzle that took the specific impulse and the properties of our propellant, whatever it was, and would create a very, very efficient uh, design. We could predict thrust, we could predict the time of burn, we could predict altitude, and so that gave a lot of rigor into our program. And so um, we, we used that book and I went to the machine shop um, and got all the machinists interested. They loved working on our rockets more than they, than they liked working on my dad's mining machinery. And pretty soon we were creating some very, very, very sophisticated rockets. I didn't know how sophisticated till we went to the county science fair and there we won a blue ribbon first place. I thought that was pretty cool. Miss Raleigh uh, convinced um, Mr. Turner uh, to put that blue ribbon in and but now we had to go to the state uh, science fair and we were absolutely sure that we would just be crushed there kids from a little coal town down in southern West Virginia we just uh, didn't have a chance at all. We also, Miss Riley had come down with Hodgkin's disease during that time. So she was in a very weakened state. It was not curable back then. She knew that she only had um, a couple of years, a few years um, uh, to live. And, uh, but she, she kept urging us boys to go on, go on, go on to the County Science Fair. Um, you know, it's participation, show them what you can do. And we went to the county science fair and we won the county, I mean, the state science fair and we won the state science fair too. Now we had to go to the national science fair and that was in Indianapolis and only one of us could go. And uh, I was the leader of the Big Creek Missile Agency. And so the boys voted to let me go and carry our rocket designs um, to uh, the national science fair. And it was in 1960. And so um, off, off I went uh, with, our, with our designs. And while I was there, um, I, after I set up the first day um, and came back the next morning, um, our uh, rocket nozzles were stolen. And, and I, I didn't understand back then uh, where I grew up. Um, I mean, even in high school, we didn't have locks on our locker. So, um, I was very naive about that. I couldn't imagine why uh, that anybody would steal my stuff. And I, the other exhibitors had locked up all their stuff at night. Now I understood why. So I had to get on the phone. I had to call my dad and um, or my mom. And my mom went to my dad, who was in the middle of a, a union strike there. And he had to settle the strike in order to get the machinists to, uh, to rebuild our rockets, get them on a bus, and um, overnight um, all the way to Indianapolis. And I just made it in the nick of time to have these nozzles um, on the display and the judges came by. And um, when the time came to, um, to announce who the winner was, they announced the third place winner. And I figured I was like, like 50th place. <laughs> they announced the second place winner. And then they announced the first place winner. And I was astonished when they named me and the other boys of the Big Creek Missile Agency uh, that we had won the gold medal of the 1960 National Science Fair. And um, I've got, this is it. And hopefully you can see it. Um, it was flown into space. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but it was flown into space on uh, the shuttle, the space shuttle by a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Takao Doi. So the Big Creek Missile Agency did make it to space. Uh, so we came back, I came back, but I have to say while I was at the science fair, of course I met all these other wonderful uh, young men and women who, um, who had these uh, very sophisticated uh, exhibits and it was clear that we didn't need to be afraid of the Russians. They needed to be afraid of us because we were serious about what we were, we were doing. Uh, we were going to college. We were gonna get these science and engineering degrees and um, we were gonna bring the United States uh, back. Uh, I do wanna to read to you, I have time here, to uh, read to you. We, we came back and decided to, to launch um, 
our last rocket. We were all graduating from high school and um, I wanted to show my appreciation to, especially to our teachers, Miss Riley, my mom, um, uh, uh, the machinists who had helped us uh, build these rockets. And um, so we decided to have one last uh, launch. Uh, my dad had never come to any of our launches, even though we did all this to impress him. Um, he had never come. And so this is what happened. Oct 31 was our last and biggest rocket, six and a half feet long, two and a half inches in diameter. We carefully raised it into a vertical position and then lowered it on the launch rod. With a rocket this size, I thought perhaps we were exceeding the critical dimensions of our propellant, which at that time we called Zinco Shine. Zinco Shine was uh, zinc dust and sulfur, which was a rather common propellant for amateur rockets back then, but we had added um, one extra ingredient and that was alcohol, pure, unadulterated, 200 proof, 100% alcohol, which was readily available at John I's Moonshine Palace up Snake Root Hollow. So we had ready access to pure alcohol. Now I hoped it wouldn't blow up, but I knew it might. I knelt at its base and started twisting together the ignition wire connection. Sonny Royley said, do you see who's here? And I looked up for my watch, who? Just look, the town constable opened a path through the crowd and there stood my father and his work clothes. And Roy Lee went after him, escorted him out on the slack. And I heard Roy Lee say, come and help us, Mr. Hickam. Oh, you don't need my help, dad said. Uh, I just came to watch and all the boys protested. No, sir, you can help any way you want, whatever you want to do, sir. And I stood up brushing the slack off my jeans. A rocket won't fly unless somebody lights the fuse. Come on, dad, this one's yours if you want it. I was surprised there was no mistaking the pure delight I saw spread across his face as he knelt in front of the firing panel. Roy Lee called from the back door. Whenever you're ready, he said. I counted down to zero and dad turned the switch. Oc 31 erupted, blowing huge chunks of concrete loose from the pad. The crowd took a step backward and some of them started to run. Oc 31 seemed to split the air that filled the narrow valley, a shockwave rippling across the slack. Women screamed and men clapped their hands to their ears. We boys came pouring outside the blockhouse. Oc 31 kept pounding us as it climbed. Men, women, and children all watched it with mouths agape, eyes wide, their cheers stuck in their throat. At the company store, those old men, not at the launch, got uncertainly to their feet as the thunder reached them. They stumbled into the road, shading their eyes, the trunk of fire and smoke tearing out of the mountain like God's finger stuck suddenly toward the sky in the church. The minister raced to the belfry and began to toll the bell in celebration. Raleigh kept his eye on his watch, 38, 39, 40. Still see it, Billy announced. The great spout of smoke turned into a dim yellow streak, just about gone, 43, 44, gone, Billy announced. Gone at 44 seconds. I did a quick calculation. Assuming it was flying nearly vertical, Oc 31 had disappeared at an altitude of 31,000 feet, nearly six miles high. I became aware of movement beside me, and I was astonished to see my father dancing in the cold dirt, waving his old hat in his hand. He was exulting to the sky. Beautiful, beautiful. And as Oc 31 raced across the sunlit sky on that glorious day, I instead watched my dad and waited patiently and with hope for him to put his arm around my shoulder and tell me at last that I had done something good. There I heard Billy yell, there it is. People surged from the road across the slack, following the other boys as they raced after our last great rocket. And dad stopped his dance and he put his head over his heart and he bent over as if a great weight had suddenly been dropped on it. He looked at me, his mouth open, and I saw in his eyes a curious mixture of happiness and pain that dissolved into fear. And I went to him and put my arm around his shoulder supporting him while he fought for air against the black lung that would kill him all too soon. He did really good, Dad, I told him, as a spasm of deep oily coughs racked his body. Nobody ever launched a better rocket than you. 
And so that's the story of the Rocket Boys. And it's told somewhat the same in the, the movie uh, October Sky. And I, was, I mentioned when I started this that I was going to uh, talk about the different ages of uh, the golden ages of uh, space flight. Uh, so I think the first one um, was, uh, uh, of course, what happened right after Sputnik. And we had the, what we know as the space race that uh, ended up with um, Apollo uh, on our side. And um, although the Russians uh, beat us during this time, uh, they beat us into orbit, obviously, with satellites. They could put much heavier satellites uh, into orbit than we could for the longest time. And then Yuri Gagarin uh, beat us uh, to have the first uh, human into space. Um, poor Laika, of course, back on Sputnik 2 was the first um, uh, living, breathing creature in space. Um, and so we had lost a lot of, uh, a lot of the races, but um, um, President Kennedy, who I met, by the way, in uh, 1960, when he was in West Virginia running for the, uh, in the primary there, um, uh, I met him right before I went to the National Science Fair and asked him the question, what he thought that we ought to do in space. And he was surprised to get that kind of question. I'm sure he hadn't given a 30 seconds thought about space because he was in the coal fields of West Virginia trying to convince uh, the coal miners there to vote for him. And uh, so he just turned it around on me and asked me what I thought that we ought to do in space. And uh, of course, I was a rocket boy. And I said, I, uh, I, had, I had a telescope that uh, I'd gotten uh, for Christmas, and I'd been looking at the moon a lot, the craters of the moon, and it just came out of me. I said, well, I think we ought to go up to the moon and just mine the blame thing. And all the coal miners in the crowd started yelling and said, oh, heck yeah, you know, it's West Virginia coal miners. We'll go up there. We can mine anything. And Kennedy thought that was pretty funny, and he laughed and said, well, elect me president, and maybe we will. And that's why I actually take responsibility um, for the Apollo program <laughs> every once in a while. But um, so, uh, however, uh, that was the great space race. Vernon Von Braun down here where I live now in Huntsville, Alabama, Rocket City, USA, uh, built the Saturn series of rockets, the great Saturn V, as we all know. And um, we were able to win the race uh, to the moon and really left the Russians, the Soviets uh, behind. And they've never really caught up, uh, caught up since. Uh, so that was the golden age of uh, the first golden age of space flight. But um, after Apollo, actually, even before Apollo 11, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed, the, the Apollo program had essentially been canceled. Uh, all the Saturn Vs, of course, Kennedy had been assassinated. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was now president, and we were in the midst of the Vietnam War, and the country was in turmoil over that. Um, so um, they just uh, canceled Apollo, the Saturn Vs, and whatever was left in the inventory. We flew those right up through Apollo 17. Uh, we had the Apollo Soyuz uh, program, and that was it. It was over as far as we were concerned. Uh, so uh, we had a, a, a long gap there before what I consider, and this is the one that I got involved with, and that was the second golden age of space flight, and that was the shuttle era. Now, in between, as mentioned, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and that's what happened to a lot of us, uh, uh, especially young men who went off to engineering school. Um, we ended up in Vietnam or in the army and the military, and so all of our hopes and dreams were put off for many, many years. But um, I kept at it. I kept trying. I worked for the Army Missile Command. Uh, I was 38 years old when NASA, in its wisdom, finally decided to hire me. And I started just as this uh, second golden age began. And that was in 1981 when the space shuttle started to fly. Now, the space shuttle. Well, is, is a very, very sophisticated design. Uh, the whole idea was to make as much of it as possible uh, to be recovered, refurbished, and reflown again. Um, it was always on the very, very narrow edge of what, was, what we were capable of in terms of technology at that time. It turned out to be a very dangerous vehicle. 
uh, but because of the dedication of the people in the shuttle program, um, uh, we could have had a lot more accident, but because of their dedication and uh, keeping this, the shuttle refurbished properly, um, except for the two horrible accidents, uh, Challenger and Columbia, uh, the shuttle program um, was, was quite successful in its own way. Um, the capability of, of flying um, a huge payload in the back of its cargo bay. And that's the program that I got involved with was Space Lab, which was a precursor to the space station. It was an experimental module that went back in the cargo bay of the, uh, of the shuttle. And inside that was a complete laboratory. Uh, the shuttle flew for a week or two, two weeks. And that meant that the Space Lab could go up with all these experiments come back and land, Space Lab, all the experiments taken out, whole brand new set of experiments put in and flown again at a later time, or if the experiment didn't work, they could uh, fix it and put it back on. Uh, and that was also the time when we started getting involved with the internationals. Uh, we brought on the European Space Agency actually built Space Lab to NASA's design, uh, but the Europeans and then the Japanese that I worked with, um, um, uh, had uh, flights also on the space lab. And we learned how to work with them, with the Europeans, with the Japanese, and with others on the space lab, which came in real, real handy um, when, we, uh, when we decided to build the International Space Station. So, and for that, of course, the cargo bay was um, perfect size to carry up the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and although I wasn't involved with the design of the Hubble, uh, I was involved, I was working as a scuba diver in a neutral buoyancy simulator, uh, helping to train Kathy Sullivan and Bruce McCandless to release the Hubble uh, into orbit in case they had to go outside and do an extra vehicular activity uh, in the uh, EMU suit. Um, that turned out to be not necessary. They were able to release it uh, internally uh, without going outside, but we had to practice it. So once the Hubble was in orbit and it was determined that it was um, nearsighted, um, we had to go up and fix it. And so the folks from Goddard, uh, especially the Goddard Space Center in Maryland came down to Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville and the astronauts came up, Story Musgrave, Kathy Thornton and her crew came up from uh, Houston and uh, we had a one-to-one -one mock up of the Hubble inside our neutral buoyancy simulator and so I was one of the lead divers on that. I actually went into the EMU suit, went through all the procedures to repair it, uh, replace the instrumentation in there. And um, we, uh, we were able to go up and uh, save the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And it's been a magnificent instrument. And so um, uh, when we decided to build the International Space Station, it, uh, the shuttle turned out to be the perfect vehicle to carry up modules that were about the same size as the Space Lab um, and connect them tinker toy-like uh, together and the big solar panels and so on. And so uh, again, that was, that was our second golden age. Using this flawed vehicle, that was, however, a very versatile uh, vehicle, especially um, for carrying big payloads into space and then um, uh, carrying large crews up there as well, and also doing extravehicular uh, type activity like bolting together the space station and uh, repairing the Hubble Space Telescope. So after the shuttle was retired, it looked like that um, we didn't know exactly what we were going to do. Uh, but um, somehow, some way, uh, I like to say that God looks after fools, drunks in the United States of America, and maybe those of us who love space. And so uh, we are now entering the third golden age of space flight. And I probably don't have to tell you um, what that is all about. Uh, um, I, I met Elon Musk in um, actually over at Space Camp. Uh, in the early 2000s, he had already made some money with his PayPal, but he and some other of his friends came to space camp. Um, I'm on the board there, by the way, here in Huntsville. I got to meet Elon. I wasn't particularly impressed, um, but um, turned out that he had some good ideas. And um, now um, uh, SpaceX um, is doing some really, really remarkable things. Um, also, uh, pardon me. 
<clears throat> also, I met Jeff Bezos, <coughs> excuse me, years ago at a book fair because he runs Amazon. And we talked a little bit about his ideas of going into space. And I understand that he saw the movie October Sky and that <clears throat> convinced him he wanted to have a rocket company. So uh, Blue Origin uh, is going to be doing some great things, uh, but we have a lot of uh, startup companies right now. Um, <clears throat> we have, um, of course, um, the Artemis program that's starting up. Uh, so all of this stuff just seems to be coming together at the right time, the right place. And I'm, uh, I am just, um, uh, I'm just very, very impressed by everything that's uh, that's going on. I've done some consulting with Blue Origin on nuclear thermal propulsion. I'm still very much a writer, though. The new book is appropriately called Don't Blow Yourself Up. And uh, it includes my time working for NASA with Japanese and, uh, and the Russians. So, um, and by the way, I'll tell you one more anecdote, and then we'll stop and see if there are any questions. Uh, but <clears throat> with, uh, and, and this is in uh, the new book, Don't Blow Yourself Up. Um, so I was sent over to Russia to negotiate um, with them. Um, it was a very desperate time. And uh, for the Russians, uh, after the Soviet Union had collapsed, and um, when I got over to Moscow, we saw how desperate a lot of them were. Um, a lot of scientists and engineers were out on the street selling their household goods, just anything um, to, to live. And um, when, when I went in and my job was to, um, was to um, negotiate with the Russians on how we would train their cosmonauts and how we would train, how they would train our astronauts. And that was pretty contentious uh, because they basically treated the cosmonauts like lab rats. And of course, for us, the astronauts were like little living gods, you know. <laughs> So we had to come to some kind of terms there. What I learned with the Russians um, was that they would, they would not agree with anything at the table, negotiating table, where you'd get them to agree and be a little bit softer about things was the inevitable party, which was fueled by vodka uh, afterwards. And uh, I started to, well, they were the same men who had actually launched Sputnik. They were still there. Uh, where our uh, Apollo guys had long since retired, shuffled off into eternity, but they were still there. So I started telling them about when I was a kid, just what I just told you, uh, growing up in West Virginia and like all the kids around the country that we were so inspired by Sputnik that we decided to become engineers and scientists. And they really, really liked that. So they, they paid attention to me and, and agreed with a lot of the things that I, I wanted them to agree with. And they said, would you like to see uh, Sputnik. And I said, well, I saw it from my backyard years ago. And they said, well, uh, no, we've built two. And so uh, I said, yes. And so they carried me uh, to the warehouse. This is now in a museum. And they showed me the second uh, iteration of Sputnik that could have been the one that flew. And uh, I thought to myself, well, you know, my life has had the perfect arc. I mean, God can strike me dead right now. I'm glad he didn't. She didn't. Uh, but um, it, uh, it was a wonderful thing to, uh, to see Sputnik. So that's uh, the three golden ages of space flight. That's my story as a rocket boy. And like I said, it's the story of a lot of young men and women that came out of the 50s and 60s, 60s of that era. And that's why we're engineers and scientists. So I'm open for questions. That's a, such a wonderful story, Homer. I, and I think you know you're you're on a call right now with a lot of young men and women that are about to start designing the Mars mission. Um, and I hope that they take some of the mindset you had and your friends had to just to build those rockets um, with them. Uh, do you have any advice for them as they as they take forth on this journey? Well, you know, I've I've um... I go out to, I, I am on the board at Space Camp, uh, so I go out and um, and kind of uh, look over all of that and all that's happening. Um, if I, I would recommend that, if possible, they, they should come to Space Camp. There are scholarships available out there. Just go out to uh, uh, spacecamp.com, and um, it's a lot of fun, and you really, really learn a lot, and we do have a, a Mars program. 
Uh, that's one of the things that we do. Um, we have a robotics. We also have a cyber camp. Uh, we have a number of different camps um, and you can really, really learn a lot. And we also have an adult camp. So um, adults come and I go out every Monday during the summer and talk to the teachers out there. Uh, I get more bang for my buck by doing that. So then they can carry the message back. So uh, yeah, Space Camp is a, is a great program if you can uh, get involved with that. And also, of course, um, I, uh, what's really cool is I'm getting a lot, a lot of young people are very interested, of course, uh, not necessarily in rocket propulsion or even um, maybe uh, some of the other sciences that seem to be more, more directed towards space. And maybe they want to be a doctor or maybe they want to be a biologist or a chemist or something like that. And I think there's going to be room, even also mining engineers. Um, I think that there's going to be room uh, in this third golden age that we're about to enter for almost all of the disciplines, geology is gonna be really, really important, but I think biology is as well, as I talked about before, um, uh, the, the uh, geology of the moon and the Mars is going, we're gonna learn so much. We have never seen, I don't know if you know it or not James, but we have never studied a single drop of water that didn't come from the earth. We never looked at a single drop of water from the moon or Mars or anything. We don't know what we're going to find. So the, I mean, the field is why, and also we're gonna need plumbers and electricians and construction people. <laughs> we're gonna need a lot, a lot of people. So just brace yourself for this great third golden age we're about to enter. Fantastic, we will, awesome. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It was a wonderful set of anecdotes and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everybody.